Hello everyone and welcome to The Question Show. Your questions, my answers, wherever you are across my channel, just go ahead, type it in, I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. I record this show every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific. So come join me live on my YouTube channel. And if you're watching this afterwards, I recorded this episode on Monday, February 8th, 2021. Duck goes quack. What is more likely? Finding life in our solar system or finding life up to 100 light years from Earth? That is, I, that's a great question. Um, I know someone say like, like I always say, like everything's a great question, but like I choose the questions because they're great questions. And so I know they're a great question. Like I understand it's redundant. Like if I've chosen the question, then it's going to be a great question because I like the best questions. But anyway, um, Right, so we're studying searching for life here in the solar system. And at the same time, we're searching for life across the universe here in the solar system, we've got perseverance going to Mars, we've got the orbiter sniffing the atmosphere for methane, we're looking for ancient fossil stratolites, we're probing into the briny depths of Enceladus and Europa, and searching for some kind of alien bacteria that might be living here in the solar system with us. So far, all the attempts to find life in the solar system haven't turned up, although some of them have been inconclusive. There was the Viking landers, there was the Allen Hills meteorite, there was the possibility of phosphine on Venus, but still nobody is super convinced that life has been found. But if we found life here in the solar system, like really conclusive life, like European space whales or a giant fossil, even on the side of an ancient riverbank on Mars, it would be incontrovertible evidence, you would know for certain that there was once life on Mars, that there was currently life on Europa, that there are European space whales, whatever it is. And it would begin more and more missions, astronauts would go, they would, you would send paleontologists to Mars, they would be digging up in the dirt, we would be pretty certain that there was life there. So, so the advantage of the solar system is that we can be certain um, you know, we're, up to this point, we don't know if it's out there. <clears throat> People think there's places here in the solar system where there could be life, but so far there just hasn't been. For the rest of the universe, our methods have to change. So the one possibility is that we are listening for signals from extraterrestrials with SETI. We, you know, we're, we're watching for laser beams coming from other worlds, we're listening for radio signals. And with radio signals, there are certain frequencies of radio signals that if you heard on one of those frequencies, an artificial signal, it would be a dead giveaway. There is no natural way that we know of that a neutron star can can provide a signal on a on a on the spectrum. So that would tell you for certain that there's life. But every other possibility is going to be inconclusive. And I, and I've, I've been feeling like, you know, like one of the techniques is going to be we're going to use our big telescopes, we're going to look at the atmospheres of of exoplanets and say, okay, are there, um, you know, the chemicals in the atmosphere that could be given off by life? Astronomers call these biosignatures. And we've learned from the whole phosphine discovery on Venus or non discovery, you know, uh, that that sensing these chemicals in the first place and confirming that they're there is actually really tricky. And, you know, um, imagine how much harder I mean, like you've got Venus, it's right there. It's huge planet, we've got big telescopes, they're not very far, and they could just barely detect the signal of some kind of life on on Venus when well, we're going to be taking the James Webb or, or these various the aerial telescope, these bigger the Habex, and trying to scan other worlds. There may very well come up. So I wouldn't be surprised in within a decade that these systems come online that someone says, we've detected methane in another on a planet on an Earth sized world orbiting a sun like star. But it won't be conclusive evidence, people will argue and we won't know for sure for decades, hundreds of years, like until you can actually send a spacecraft, you can't know for sure. So you can communicate. So I think we um, I, I, do, I don't think we'll know either one. I don't think we'll, we'll, we'll keep chasing life here in the solar system, and it'll be hard to build the case that life was ever here. And we'll keep scanning the universe for life. And we just won't 
find something that's super convincing. So it's 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 going to be tough. It's going to be hard, and and it won't be a slam dunk. It won't be case closed. Just prepare yourself for. We think we found evidence. Maybe astronomers have confirmed. Astronomers are speculating. That's what the future holds. Dado Pharmaceutical also laundry and tan. Can you use special suits exoskeleton to simulate gravity? I get this question a lot where we talk about how being in microgravity is bad for the human body and that you need to have, you know, right now astronauts have to work out all the time. And so one possibility people say is, well, could you just wear some kind of suit that uh, resists and it feels like it's magnetically connected to the ground and every step that you take, it's pushing against you and it makes it feel like you're in gravity. And I think that would be a benefit just for the kinds of activities that we want to do where we just want to like stand at a desk and we want to walk around and sit in a chair. Like you can imagine if you had some suit that was attempting to mimic gravity, that would that would be helpful. And it would definitely help with some of the muscles and some of the other issues that you'd be facing. But part of the problem with microgravity is that we have all of these inner problems. There's problems with your eyesight, there's problems with fluid redistribution around your body, and you need to have gravity to fix those problems. So a suit, although it would help with some of those wouldn't help with the with a lot of the bigger problems. And we just don't know what the long term issues are over years. So I think um, we're going to need to generate some kind of artificial gravity. That's the solution. Garth T. Would it be possible to collect water from somewhere in space and boil it as propulsion? It would be obviously no good to get to space, but if the ship is already in space and so is the water, is it worth using? Absolutely. This is actually a propulsion idea that that is being considered right now by a bunch of people. It's called a steam propulsion system. And literally, you take water, you boil it inside the spaceship, and then you blast the vapor, the steam out the end of the of the of the rocket, the steam rocket, and it works like a rocket and it works well. And it's crude, like you're not having the incredible pressures and temperatures of a of a Raptor engine, but you're scooping up water ice, you're boiling it inside your spaceship, and you're blasting it out the back of the spaceship, and it's giving you propulsion. So it's, so it's using a resource that's very common. And so yeah, this idea has been close. So do, you know, put a, some links, but look for a steam rocket. Um, and in fact, you can build uh, water rockets, bottle rockets here on Earth. So clearly that works. The other idea that's being tested out, and actually NASA is in the process of, of developing a mission that's going to that's going to try this out on a CubeSat, is they're going to take water, they're going to use electrolysis to separate the water into the hydrogen and the oxygen. And then they're going to um, uh, recombine them like a liquid hydrogen oxygen rocket, and then use that to create thrust that's going to come up the back of the rocket. So there's other ways that you can use hydrogen and oxygen, really water is the key. If you can get your hands on water, it unlocks all kinds of advantages in space. So I uh, yeah, I think it's going to be it's going to be the way to go. SA with optical interferometry, could you build a space telescope in installments and with less demanding requirements regarding the size of the launchers? For those of you who don't know, optical interferometry or interferometry is where you take the light from multiple telescopes and you combine it so that they act like a big telescope. But it's not just that you're adding the light, like say you had five one meter telescopes and you added the light. It's not that you're getting one five, the equivalent of one five meter telescope. That's easy. That is just you can absolutely add the light from five different one meter telescopes and that gives you the equivalent of a of a total collecting surface area of five meters. But what interferometry lets you do is it lets you separate the telescopes so that you're when you're receiving signals from you know, when you're looking at light, you're actually your telescopes are acting like a telescope that is as big as the separation between them. It's called the baseline. And so if you take two one meter telescopes, and you separate them five meters, it's the equivalent of a telescope that is five meters across. And that's way bigger than five, you know, two individual telescopes. It's, you know, I haven't done the math, 
pi r squared. Anyway, it's it's an enormous surface area of a telescope, you get high resolution. So it's really good for bright objects like quasars or the sun or things like that. But you don't get a lot of um, sensitivity. So it's not good for faint objects. Um, and the wider apart you put those telescopes, you, if you move the two telescopes a kilometer apart, then they act like a telescope that is a kilometer across, but it can only see very, very bright objects, you can't see dim objects, but with incredible resolution. And so that's why the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, which imaged the the Event Horizon of the black hole at the heart of M87, um, used the entire you know telescopes around the world and you pretended like it was a telescope the size of planet Earth. The trick is that you have to align your telescopes so that they are perfect, that they are essentially receiving exactly the same wavelength of photon, the exact same photon. Um, and so for example, when you've got radio waves, the photons can be centimeters long, meters long, uh, kilometers long, eventually. Um, and so it's very easy just using clocks, you know, you're both pointing at this object, you're receiving all this data, and you're going, okay, you know, look at the data, chain, you know, check the time, and then you match up the wavelengths, and boom, you've got your telescope, you do it after the fact on computer, with visible light interferometers, like the very large telescope, you have to do it live, you literally have to take the telescopes to remove them, a little farther, a little closer until essentially the wavelengths line up, and you're getting uh, perfect interference interferometry between those two telescopes, down to the nanometer, right down to the the 100 nanometers, when you think about the wavelength of different colors of light. So one of the ideas is absolutely to fly spacecraft in space, have them align themselves. And then in space, it's very easy to keep things exactly the right distance apart and make tiny adjustments as there's gravitational interactions with them. And so, uh, yeah, in theory, you can launch multiple telescopes, have them be a certain distance apart, have them act like an inter interferometer, and you would be able to have a telescope that acts like a five meter telescope, a 10 meter telescope, a 50 meter telescope, a 100 meter telescope. But there's a lot of technical unknowns about launching these these spacecraft having them align with each other, maintaining alignment, combining the light, being able to download the light in a way that uh, you can use on Earth. So uh, there's been proposals to do this, there was a mission called the terrestrial planet finder, uh, that never flew, but it was sort of like the, the greatest mission, in my opinion, because it, it would be exactly that there's going to be a gravitational wave observatory called Lisa that's going to do that. But in the but it's going to be an interferometer, it's going to be getting the spacecraft perfectly aligned with each other. But in this case, it's shooting lasers back and forth to detect gravitational waves. So uh, yeah, an interferometer makes a ton of sense, more sense in space. But of course, sending things to space is more complicated and expensive. So there you go. Professor Newman, where are the moons of Jupiter relative to the magnetosphere of Jupiter? Would a Jovian moon base get shelter from space radiation or be left out or pass in and out getting fried by the Van Allen belts? The moons of Jupiter are largely in the radiation belts of Jupiter. Uh, as you get farther and farther away from Jupiter out when you think about the way that the moons are aligned, and Io is just heart of the storm and Callisto is far less dangerous. But no matter where you are in the Jovian, I mean, literally, no matter where you are in space, you're going to be eating radiation day and night. So you need protection, you need to be under the ice, but you don't need a lot of ice, like a meter of ice, if you could get under, you know, put a blanket of a meter of ice blanket over top of you and your space colony, then you're protected, you're fine. So I think that's, that's all you got to do is if you can just dig underground, dig under the ice on probably Ganymede, that's my favorite Ganymede, as I've mentioned before, Ganymede is the new Europa. Uh, go to Ganymede, dig under, you know, because it's got a magnetosphere, it's got uh, lots of ice, it's the right place to go and dig under the ice and you'll be safe. Some rye hash. Do you think public funding can help get some large scale space projects started such as spinning habitats rapid as progress is it needs to be faster? I well, I mean, like, that's what a government is, is a is a public funding. I mean, when you look at things like um, you know, artificial gravity, like the Nautilus X mission, 
I think the budget that I saw for that was like $1.4 million. And it was like this big toroidal ring that would sit on the side of the International Space Station and, um, you know, and spin around and provide the astronauts some kind of artificial gravity. And it was in the multiple billions of dollars to install this thing. So like you can't do a GoFundMe or a Kickstarter to raise that kind of money. Uh, there have been much smaller missions that have been proposed. The The Russians like 10 years ago wanted to build a tiny little artificial gravity chamber for mice and there were rats and they were going to launch it and it was going to spin and they were going to see how it did for the right for the rats and then they you know once it, they'd been in space for some length of time they're going to bring them back and see what this had done to their bodies. And there isn't really even that kind of testing level of testing that's going on. I mean, right now, the opinion is none that nobody is actively planning to build any kind of long term artificial gravity. And I think the reason is because for the state that space exploration is at right now, it's not necessary. Like we know that Scott Kelly could spend a year in space, and he was fine. I mean, he was definitely weak when he got back to Earth. And he definitely had to build up his muscles. And, and you know, he was feeling nauseated and and uh, lots of problems with his blood pressure and all kinds of things. But still, he was able to bounce back from it. And now he's, you know, he's fine. So I mean, you could probably and you could probably go longer, you could probably go to two years, or maybe even three years, and at a certain point, it's going to start getting dangerous. But I'm sure we're going to test out the limits of that. And when you think about the kinds of missions that are going to happen, you're gonna have astronauts going to the International Space Station, astronauts going to the Lunar Gateway, astronauts going to the surface of the moon and on to Mars. At no point, is anybody living in space for any long period of time. And so I think for the long term horizons, we definitely need to know how to counteract microgravity and how to produce artificial gravity. But but we don't have like a purpose for it, a need for it. It's a nice to have. It's not a need to have. Instead of building and operating a very complicated multi billion dollar centrifuge on the International Space Station, you send a treadmill and some weights and they work out. That's the strategy. So so I think that I mean, you know, obviously, we see we hear about people like the Gateway Foundation are planning to build a gigantic ring that's going to uh, they're going to dock starships to and so on. And who knows what's going to happen once starship truly starts flying and things that used to seem like incredibly expensive start to become reasonable. But for now, although it's a big unknown, and although it 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 is the giant is sort of the great stumbling block to inhabiting space. It's like the one thing that we can't fix so far. There's no huge priority to do it. And so no one sort of keeps putting it to the top of their queue right now. But eventually, I'm sure someone will sort it out. Ted Krause, your thoughts on Bezos putting his satellite in space like Starlink? If, if you think Starlink is the beginning of satellites in space that are providing telecommunications to Earth like, like this is just the beginning. Yes, yeah, Starlink is going to launch 42,000. Amazon or Bezos Blue Origin can do their version of it. The Chinese are going to have their own version, the Russians are going to have their own version, other countries are going to have their own version like this is over. Um, there's going to be a lot of satellites. And on the one side, as we, you know, we keep talking about this, right? Starlink is kind of amazing. Uh, and in fact, Starlink, they announced they're going to come up with a cheaper version, they're going to probably be doing a, a cell phone version. Um, like, in a few years, and it won't be long, you are going to be able to receive satellite signals on your phone, anywhere on Earth, all the time. And it's going to be almost free. That is, that is the future. That's where this is all going to go. And it might be 10 years, maybe 20 years, 20 years, you will have a device that is connected to the satellite internet that allows you to go anywhere on Earth and have as fast an internet connection as you could possibly want. And it's going to come from 10s of 1000s of satellites by multiple providers competing in space launching all the time. That's the future. Um, and it sucks. And it's great. We're gonna, you know, for us, 
you know, people are people are always nervous about like, we're going to lose the night sky, but we're not gonna lose the night sky. I, I guarantee you can go outside and, and look up and you wouldn't be able to spot a Starlink or a an Amazon link or a one web or whatever, you wouldn't be able to see any of them. They're just too faint for the vast majority of people, you gotta have really good conditions, really good eyesight, it's gotta be really dark, it's gotta be the right time of year, you gotta be the right latitude for you to be able to see these things. So for regular people, it's not gonna happen. And we've lost the night sky. Like, like, if if you are sad about satellites, you should be furious about light pollution. Like the thing that has stolen the night sky from all of us is people leaving their lights on outside in cities that that if you have never been to a truly dark sky place and seen the Milky Way with your own eyes, then then you don't know what you're missing. It is transcendent. And, and so satellites are going to be nothing compared to the damage that's already been done to the night sky, they're, they're going to be imperceptible. The thing that's going to be paying the price is astronomy. The big telescopes, the observatories, they're the ones that are going to be losing the night sky. And it's not going to be like suddenly telescopes don't work. It's just going to be night after night after night. They have to they have to pull satellite trails out of their images again and again and again. And so like it took you one night to do your observations, and then it's going to take two nights to do your observations, then it's going to take you five nights to do your observations, it's just going to get um, it's just going to be an ordeal. But that is the price that we will pay for a magical satellite connection that allows us to communicate with the world. And for billions of people who are never able to connect to the internet will now be able to connect to the internet. So welcome to the future. But but like, like, again, like if you're like in any way, shape or form grumpy about what these satellites are going to be doing, then take action about dark skies, help preserve dark sky locations, help, um, you know, you're, you talk to your city about switching out the lights so that you, your city produces less, less light pollution. Um, that should be your priority, like take all that rage and channel it into, uh, into fighting for dark skies just in general, because that's already been taken away from us. John Seville asks, can rogue planets be made without the help of a sun? We think so. Um, you know, like right now, when you think about how a star is born, um, it, you know, you've got this primordial gas, hydrogen and dust left over from the from the Big Bang, and something causes triggers the star cloud, the gas cloud to collapse, and it turns into a um, uh, into a star at the center and it's surrounded and then the star, you know, as it you know, they always like the skater spinning, right pulls in its arms, you know, the star closes in and spins up faster and faster and faster. And then you get this accretion disk forming around it. And then all and then the planets form is knots in the accretion disk. And then the star really ignites and blasts out the radiation and clears out all the material that's that's in between you're left with a star with planets orbiting around it. But we now know that there's tons and tons of these brown dwarfs all over the place. And so they are just smaller versions of stars. So imagine you've just got a smaller version, and you've got this brown dwarf at the center, and it spins up fast, and it gets this accretion disk around it. And then it's putting out sort of feeble radiation, maybe it doesn't even clear out the dust in the accretion disk, I don't really know. Um, and so it's gonna, you know, the brown dwarfs will inevitably have planets orbiting around them. And the rogue planets are just a smaller version of that. So imagine you would have like a, you know, a Jupiter's worth of gas and dust that collects together into a planet, and then you've got it just sitting there. And and now it really looks like, um, like, you know, the look like the world is spiders, right? The world, the world is really just spiders, like we think we're, we're, um, you know, the life, but really, it's, you know, wherever you are, the spiders all around you, well, it's, it's probably that way with rogue planets, I've heard anywhere from one to 10 times as many rogue planets as there are just regular stars and regular planets in the in the Milky Way. So so in fact, there's going to be tons and tons of them out there. And what's really interesting to me about rogue planets is they kind of change our concept 
of of what a like what it would be like to explore the Milky Way, because we sort of imagine, you know, if you want to go to another star system, you've got to leave your star, you've got to be able to fly to Alpha Centauri, it's a whatever, it's a four light year journey. But if there really are 10 times as many rogue planets just wandering around throughout the Milky Way, then in fact, you only have to be able to make it like a 10th of the journey, like you don't have to go very far. And then you could set up at one of these rogue planets and harvest the resources It's going to be ice and you know, maybe you're gonna have a gas giant with ice moons orbiting around it, and you could use this as a pit stop. And so in fact, exploring the Milky Way could potentially be a lot easier than we thought, because there's just, you know, imagine there were um, 10 times as many gas stations as you thought. I love it. So thanks to all our patrons. Thanks to John Sears, The Mysterious Mark, Ert O'Hara, John Grigg, Karsten Nielsen, Andrew Hudson, and the rest of our 855 patrons for their generous support. Want our videos early with no ads? Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Sean Marson asks, Hey Fraser, if we used a light seal to go to a nearby star, I know there's the problem of how to stop. Couldn't we flip the sail around halfway there and use the pressure from the destination star? So it depends on how fast you're going to try to go. So when we're talking about like the idea of the breakthrough starshot, right, you've got these tiny little spacecraft that are being accelerated by a big powerful laser, and they're going to be accelerated to 10% the speed of light. And then they're going to make the journey across space 40 years they are going to arrive at Alpha Centauri. And then they're going to do a flyby through the Alpha Centauri system, take a bunch of pictures, send them home, and then they're out into space, like a super Oumuamua. If you went a lot slower, then in theory, you could use the starlight to slow yourself down. But um, you've got to get really close to the star because you were accelerated by a laser. Now, if you were only accelerated by the light of the sun, then you could do the reverse when you if you only accelerate with the light of the sun, then when you get to the other star system, you could decelerate yourself with the light of the sun, and you would be able to go into orbit. But as long as you accelerated yourself with a laser, unless you have a laser at the place at your destination, you're going to uh, be going too fast. And you're gonna just go on a hyperbolic orbit through this the star system and you're never coming back. So if you're willing to go slowly, then you can slow yourself down when you get to your destination. But if you want to go fast, there's no way to slow yourself down. Shay Whelan, how far will we see with the new James Webb scope? Of course, get all your jokes out about James Webb. James Webb is launching on October 31st, 2021. We are nine months away. It is going to launch. It is going to happen. So get that out of the way. What will we be able to see with James Webb? Now, I mean, James Webb, like to ask, like, how far can you see with the telescope? It depends on what you're looking at. James Webb will be able to see um, dwarf planets here in the solar system. James Webb will be able to see the atmospheres of exoplanets orbiting around other stars. So it'll be able to do the kinds of things that telescopes already do all the time, just better. But like, what's the farthest thing James Webb is going to be able to see? And right now, when you use the Hubble Space Telescope, like when you think about when Hubble did the deep field survey, what they did is they took Hubble, they pointed at one region in Ursa Major for hundreds of hours, and just stared and stared and stared, and then just collected every single photon that they could see. And using Hubble, you can get out to like a billion years after the formation of the universe, you know, after the cosmic microwave background radiation. But you can't really see a lot farther than that. Um, but there's a few tricks if you use gravitational lensing, where you've got a foreground galaxy, and you've got a background galaxy, and the light is coming from the background galaxy, and it's going around the foreground galaxy, uh, then the foreground galaxy acts like a lens for the object that's a lot farther. And what you get is you're able to literally, you know, we, the, the front galaxy acts like a telescope to show the, the farther galaxy. And so using that technique, there's about, oh, I think there's about a 1000 known gravitational lenses, and each one gives you this view of a galaxy. And so you've got these like these t tiny little pinholes 
in the universe where you're able to every now and then, you know, there's like as far as Hubble can see. And then every now and then there's these little spots you can see, you know, farther. Now you're seeing half a million, sorry, half a billion years after the universe began or 250 million years after the universe began, but only in very specific locations where the galaxies line up perfectly. James Webb will just do that anywhere it wants just raw power, you point James Webb at any spot in the universe, stare long enough, and you will be looking all the way back to almost the beginning of the universe, that time when the first galaxies were coming together. But there's a little bit farther that astronomers really need to see. And so, you know, when you look, think about that, you're looking all the way out to the to the time when the big galaxies are coming together. But earlier than that in the universe is the time when the first stars were forming. And right now we don't have any technique beyond maybe radio waves to be able to detect those first stars forming. And so um, there's a future like Louvoir, when Louvoir launches, I mean, it'll be like an eight to 15 meter telescope, it will be able to go all the way to the point that the first stars were forming in the universe, literally the first time the universe lit up after the cosmic microwave background. That's one of the reasons why Louvoir and there's another space telescope that's in the works called origins, which will be kind of like a super version of James Webb, it'll have like a nine meter telescope, but it'll be sensitive to the infrared and the way that James Webb is. And it'll also be able to look out to those first stars that are forming after the beginning of the universe. So James Webb will just through raw power be able to go all the way to, to see the stuff that Hubble needs to do these kind of bank shots to see. And uh, but then follow on telescopes will be able to go right out to literally the beginning of of everything. Arjun, could gravitational lensing be messing up our data concerning the microwave background radiation like the age of the universe, etc. Um, hmm, well, gravitational lensing. So we talked about gravitational lensing just a second ago here. And so would that be messing up our data? Uh, you could see like I know that astronomers can see the cosmic microwave background in through the, the gravitational lensing that they do. But, but they could sort of adapt and adjust for it. In fact, there's some really interesting research that's being done using quasars. So what astronomers will do is they will use like distant quasars that are shining through just the intergalactic medium, just the gas and dust that is just out there in space. And the way the dark matter blobs and the way the galaxy cluster blobs sort of work, they can cause this gravitational lensing. And they can help reveal the 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 distribution of gas and dust that's out there in the universe in between galaxies. And this is this technique has been used to find the missing matter in the universe, not the dark matter, but the missing regular matter. But I don't think that gravitational lensing causes that big of an issue for observing the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, you know, that's been been, you know, dust is the problem for viewing the CMB not gravitational lensing. There was like a really interesting piece of news that came out like today, um, when I'm recording this, which was that astronomers have used pulsars to potentially map the primordial gravitational waves, essentially the background gravitational waves of the universe, because pulsars act like incredibly sensitive beacons that you can measure the distance that light is traveling, you know, because they're so regular. And so as gravitational waves are rolling over these pulsars, the pulsars are sort of shifting back and forth in space. And so astronomers have been observing pulsars for like a decade, very carefully, and they think that they've been able to detect the evidence of background gravitational waves as sort of if you can imagine these pulsars like buoys sitting on the water as waves are rolling up and down and you can and you can detect them sort of shifting back and forth. And if that's true. That's really exciting. That's that's way ahead of of when most people were going to predict that we would detect primordial background gravitational waves, which is kind of kind of exciting. So I'll keep you posted on that. That totally unrelated to our Jones question, but I just, I just needed to shoehorn that in there. Chris Sender asks, any plans for the Titan drone to photograph one of the oceans? 
in case you missed it, uh, we had one of the researchers from the Titan Dragonfly project on the weekly space hangout this week. So if you're looking for like another thing to watch that has me and a bunch of other space journalists, uh, you should totally watch that. So this is really, I'm answering this question to give you a shameless plug for the weekly space hangout. Uh, check it out. Uh, upcoming interview with Avi Loeb, upcoming interview with uh, the showrunner for Stargate. But no, no, the Titan Dragonfly probe is, uh, of course, this incredible, uh, it's a hexacopter with a nuclear battery on board, it's gonna be flying around in the skies of Titan, observing this world will not be able to go anywhere near the seas, the seas are at the poles, and Titan the dragonfly is going near the equator. And the main reason for that is so that dragonfly can communicate with Earth. So so if it goes up near the poles, it's really difficult for it to be able to communicate back home with Earth. So unfortunately, there are no plans to send dragonfly anywhere near any of you know the poles to collect any of that information. That said, like, the RTG on the dragonfly is going to last forever. Like, Think about curiosity 2012 curiosity landed on mars so we're we're closing in on like nine years since curiosity has been there uh the voyager spacecraft like we're still getting signals from the voyagers i mean sure they couldn't probably operate a hexacopter in a titan environment but still um we should see that thing operate for a long long time so stay tuned um but you're going to need a little more infrastructure, you're going to need some kind of satellite, probably a polar satellite that's orbiting around Titan, that can act as a relay satellite to send signals back to Earth. And then you probably want like a submarine or a sailboat or something to be able to really explore submarine submarines, the right machine. So you send a submarine orbiter combo to Titan that delivers the submarine into the into the polar seas, and then the orbiter is retransmitting the data back up to space. One of the really cool things about those seas, I know I'm like, I'm completely, you know, going off in tangents today. One of the really cool things about those seas is that they are pretty transparent to to radio signals. So normally water is the worst, you need a te technology like, like sonar, or you need, um, you know, some kind of uh, tether, and then you communicate from the tether. But liquid methane is actually reasonably clear. And so you could actually communicate from your submarine up to space, no matter where it is, and to be able to, to retransmit those signals. So yeah, come on, let's get on with the uh, with the Titan submarine. Adhesive Wombat. What is your astrophotography setup back there? That is a 80 millimeter apochromatic refractor with a black and white CCD chip, but I've removed the camera and I've put a eyepiece on it, visible eyepiece. And so we we take it out whenever something really interesting has happened, like when Mars got to its closest point, uh, when, um, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, and it's it's fine, it's a good, it's a good telescope. Um, the mount is very heavy and it's a pain in the ass to use. <laughs> So, um, as you probably know, I have access to a much faster, much better uh, telescope, uh, thanks to Oceanside Photo and Telescope in Landers, California. So I've got this amazing telescope with a really fancy mount and a really fancy camera that I can use anytime I want, uh, you know, from in the house. So mostly that thing collects dust. Uh, I don't recommend getting uh, like unless you're serious about astrophotography, I don't recommend getting a telescope like that. Like, like for most people, people always ask me like, what telescope should I get? Get a Dobsonian eight inch, no bigger, no smaller, just get an eight inch. Yeah. But yeah, no, I feel I feel bad. I it collects dust. Eric one asks, uh, what type of radiation is Jupiter emitting? Jupiter is emitting well, I guess Jupiter is emitting infrared radiation. It's kind of warm. Uh, it emits a little bit of x ray radiation from the various auroral events that are happening at its poles. But the, you know, the big magnetosphere that's around Jupiter is the same kind of magnetosphere that we have around Earth, it's made of trapped radiation. So particles from the sun, the solar wind are passing through the the magnetic field of the global magnetic field of the planet, and they just get caught up 
going around in orbits around the planet and they get concentrated. And so we have one with Earth and Jupiter has one that's like 20 times more powerful. Saturn has one, um, just wherever you get a, a magnetic field interacting with a stream of particles coming from a star, you get a very uh, dangerous radiation environment. Jay McDonald, with Blue Origin's continued success and no commercial operation, do you think that Blue Origin is a serious industry contender or a billionaire pet project? Love your content. Huh? Is Blue Origin a contender? Probably. Um, I think that I think that Blue Origin is a contender. Uh, you know, at this point, Blue Origin has probably been operating longer than SpaceX has. I actually haven't. I don't know the the actual date that Blue Origin started. Uh, you know, of course, their their logo, their their saying is like progress ferociously, gradual progress ferociously, something like that. And so they're going very slow and steady, and they're not having the dramatic crashing starships like we saw with SpaceX. We see just every few months another New Shepard launches, lands safely, works perfectly. So are they a serious contender? Well, so there's like there's two parts to Blue Origin, right? There is the rocket engine part. And that's very successful. They're they've already got customers for their methane, their BE four rocket engine, uh, they're going to be on the Vulcans, there's probably gonna be other people that are using it's sort of like a it's a way to replace all of the Russian, Ukrainian uh, rocket systems that are being used in America with home built versions. So I think we can def safely say that the that the rocket engine department of the company is is doing great. Um, but what about the big launchers like the new Glenn? Well, in theory, the plan is that we're expecting to see a new Glenn test probably sometime this year. And it's all been secret. But we've seen some hints, we've seen them picking up their own facilities, their own landers, their own their boat, they bought a like an old uh, cargo boat to land the rockets on. We've seen what the launch fairing looks like, and it's big. And when you look at the capacity of the new Glenn, the new Glenn is 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 going to be a monster. Like it's it's bigger and more powerful than the Falcon Heavy. Um, so it's a so it's a you know it's not going to be as big and as powerful as the Starship, and it's not fully reusable. So I don't think that it if Starship works as planned. Um, Blue Origin New Glenn won't be able to compete against that because you just can't compete against a fully reusable rocket. But if Starship has some problems or New Glenn comes works well, or they're able to figure out a fully reusable version of it, and I'm sure they are, then it'll be a serious contender. And of course, they can always just copy SpaceX, <laughs> they can always just do the same thing that SpaceX does, you know, have their own version of stainless steel New Glenn, maybe that's what the new Armstrong will be. So I think that in and, and, and Jeff Bezos money is bottomless like just bottomless like you just keep spending money year after year after year to get this right. So yeah, I think that I think that Blue Origin will be a serious contender to SpaceX. But but there's but there's so much to be said for SpaceX just testing and rapidly iterating. And that's why I, I feel like you see this really rapid pace of development coming out of SpaceX and, and Elon Musk is this, this understanding that that the competition is going to be hot on his heels, and they need to sort this out and corner the world's launch industry as quickly as possible. You know, I think Elon Musk also, of course, is is thinking about existential crises, artificial intelligence, although you can't run from aliens or from from artificial intelligence to Mars, Elon, they'll, they'll chase you there. Um, you know, or global pandemic or, or whatever, right. So I think that that there is a sort of a hustle, there's a sense of urgency that is in SpaceX that is not in Blue Origin. And yet that's that sense of urgency is in Amazon. So it's weird to me that the same guy who runs both companies doesn't have the same style, same management style. So anyway, we'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, I think I would give it I give Blue Origin a 50 50 chance of being a serious contender to SpaceX. But I think SpaceX once Starship flies, they're gonna run away with it, like fully reusable two stage rocket, nothing else will be able to compete against that. Grumman pilot 99. What is your telescope collection? Like, I have like, three telescopes, I have the one behind me, I have like a little tiny 
Dobsonian, like a four inch Dobsonian. Uh, and I have a Galileo scope. So and I've got a pair of astronomical binoculars. So I don't have a lot I am thinking of picking up an like an eight inch Dobsonian, just because I just I love Dobbs, they're the way. Phil DeShane, if Earth was tidally locked to the sun, would the surface gravity be the same, less or more? The surface gravity would be less. Um, the no wait more. Okay, so <laughs> right now, uh, because the Earth is turning when you're standing at the equator, you experience the gravity that's pulling you down towards the Earth, and you also experience an outward force from the rotation of the Earth, but it's minor, it's like a fraction of a kilogram. Um, but if the Earth was tidally locked to the sun, they would always be facing one side of the sun, it would effectively be not rotating. And so you would, you would become a little bit heavier. Mitch Harpino, with missions to the moon in the future, are there plans to build some sort of telescope on the moon? Nothing official. Um, there are no specific plans, but there are some really interesting ideas to build a telescope on the moon. The one that I like the best is to build a radio telescope on the moon, um, where you essentially land a spacecraft, it deploys a rover, the rover rolls out from the lander deploying wire onto the surface of the moon in this big, huge pedal formation, like kilometers long, and then it returns to the site, and then does another shape. And so it deploys these, these little uh, detectors all the way. And then you could create this gigantic radio telescope on the far side of the moon that is safe from radio traffic on Earth and would allow us to see like right out to the beginning of the universe. It's a great idea. Not that expensive. It's the perfect place to do it. So I hope that's what we see first. Citizen Casey, if we receive a signal such as the wow signal, can we be sure where it came from considering star drift and our own wobble within our galaxy over the thousands of years from the signal travel? Yeah, you can. Um, I mean, although definitely the signals take some period of time, like let's say our Alpha Centauri takes four years for signals to get to us. You know, the farthest we can reasonably detect a signal from an alien civilization is like a thousand light years away if they're like pointing a coherent beam of radio waves right at planet Earth. And a 1000 years stars don't move very much like over 10s of 1000s of years, hundreds of 1000s of years, stars are moving in, in the sky, but a 1000 years, like a teeny little bit in space. So I wouldn't worry, we know which star was sending the signal. If you want a single comprehensive resource for space news, you'll want to subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. Every Friday, I send out a magazine of space news with dozens of stories, pictures, brief highlights, and links you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. It's totally free. And did you know that all my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so that you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up on your audio device. Go to universetoday.com slash audio or search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes. Thanks to everyone watching here and on Twitch and to everyone who asked a question. If you want to ask a question for an upcoming show, you can post it in the YouTube comments or on Patreon, or you can join me live on my YouTube channel every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Thanks to all the moderators and a special thanks as always to Chad Weber, Nancy Graziano, and we'll see you next week.